And, and these guys have this legacy that they've created. People expect uh, all this support from their chair, which is really the problem. And so we're not trying to make a better chair. We're trying to upend the idea of what a chair is. And that's not an easy thing to do because everybody thinks they know what a chair is. They're wrong. Let's learn how our next guest gets up, dress up, and show up on purpose. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Best Morning Routine Ever podcast. I am your host, Looney Lewis, and today I have a phenomenal guest to the show, Dr. Turner Osler. Dr. Turner is a retired academic trauma surgeon turned research epidemiologist. He is the CEO and founder of QOR360, a company specializing in active sitting products for homes, offices, and schools designed to help alleviate problems caused by sitting. Dr. Osler and his team are passionate to help educate a new generation on active sitting and support an aging population with back pain. Dr. Osler has published over 300 peer-reviewed medical papers and book chapters. As a physician who suffered from a tyranny of conventional chairs for most of his life, Dr. Osler's quest for a healthier way to sit led him to develop the Red Rocker, a new geometric solid, the eccentric bicylinder. Dr. Turner, welcome to the show. Nice to meet you, Linda. Yes, it's a pleasure having you on the show. I'm um, looking forward to um, hearing uh, more about the Red Rocker, but before we get right into it, go ahead and tell us about your journey here so far. Well, um, you know, I... Um, I uh, started out as an undergrad in neurobiology, um, and then I went to medical school, and then I got kind of hooked on surgery. So I spent uh, 25 years as an academic trauma surgeon, um, you know, taking care of people with, you know, car wrecks, gunshot wounds, burns, that kind of thing. Um, and, um, you know, it was it was an exciting life. I was teaching medical students and residents and, you know, writing academic papers and um, but then um, I got a grant from the NIH, and I got a master's in biostatistics, and I switched to the research track, kind of um, trying to figure out which trauma centers were doing better and which were doing had less good results, and trying to figure out how we could, you know, optimize care for trauma patients. Mm -hmm. But I this caused me to switch from being the peripatetic trauma surgeon, you know, running from clinic to the ICU to rounds and back to the OR and then back to clinic to just sitting all day. And all of a sudden, my back started bothering me for the first time in my life. And I, I thought, well, how hard can this be? You know, I'll just, I'll just like figure it out. But, um, you know, I spent years kind of looking into the problem. And it turns out nobody really understood back pain very well. And um, so uh, after, you know, some soul searching, I just decided that it was a problem worth solving because 80% of America has back pain that'll get them into a physician's office at some point in their life. So it's a it's an immense problem that affects a lot of people. But, um, you know, I was uh, dismayed to find that not much work had been done. So uh, at the end of the day, I finally had to invent our own solution to the problem. Um, and, you know, I have no business inventing anything or running a business because, you know, I'm a washed up trauma surgeon for crying out loud. But um, I, I was lucky enough to fall in with a group of people who um, do know how to make stuff at a makerspace here in Burlington, Vermont, who had real design shops. You know, they studied in New York at Pratt and this and that. And really within a, a year and a half or so, we had very uh, solid uh, products that allowed people to sit better. And we found people loved them. Mm -hmm. So we thought, okay, fine. Now we'll just... Uh, now it's just a matter of uh, getting everybody in America to sit on one of our chairs. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
and, and you're out to solve a big problem and you're right majority of americans are suffering from this issue simply because of the nature of our work you know we're, we're not in the field anymore we're not outside anymore we are in the office we're sitting eight plus hours a day and then we go home and we sit again <laughs> Right. No, it's it's crazy because, you know, really um, just a hundred years ago, you know, we were all working on farms and a couple hundred years before, well, just a few thousand years ago, we were hunter gatherers. We spent three million years hunting and gathering. You know, we never sat down on a chair. And so this whole business of sitting on chairs is brand new to our anatomy and and sitting on chairs all day long. Well, that's that's inc that's it, it's a terrible it's a science fair experiment that's gone terribly wrong. You know, we have this epidemic of back pain, and we also have another epidemic, at, which to me is even worse as an epidemiologist, an epidemic of what we call sitting disease, which is the constellation of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and uh, an increase in all cause mortality. It turns out that sitting eight hours a day makes people die on average two or even three years sooner than they would have otherwise. Wow. So it's a, it's, it's a, so sitting is really as bad for people as smoking is. And, you know, we, in fact, you may have heard that sitting is the new smoking, right? So in the fifties, you know, we, we finally understood that smoking was terrible for people. You know, it was not, not just, not just lung cancer, but heart disease and emphysema and, uh, amputations of limbs for vascular disease. I mean, it was terrible. And then we tumbled to, oh, it's all from smoking. So, you know, now we finally managed to get most of the population to stop smoking. But just as people couldn't notice smoking because it seemed normal, people today can't notice sitting in chairs because we think it's normal to sit in a chair for eight or 10 hours a day. It's not, you know, we're hunter gatherers. Right. That's why the, the stand-up desk is such a big hit now, because people are waking up that right. um, it's time to and, be on your feet better so you can move and be active. Right, except, and here's the, it's, it's bad news, but it turns out that when sitting turned, well, turned out to be a, uh, a bad idea, everyone said, well, let's just stand up, because standing is the opposite of sitting, right? Yeah. Well... It's not, actually. The opposite of sitting is moving. If you watch people at a standing desk, they're not doing Tai Chi. You know, they lock a hip and then they're locked in position all day long. And because they're standing in one position, you know, it's, it's actually worse for them than sitting. It's, it's been, uh, Smith et al. published a paper in the American Journal of Epidemiology uh, out of uh, Canada where they followed... Um, 7,300 people for 10 years, an immensely expensive and time-consuming study to do. Half of the people in the study were at standing uh, occupations and half were at uh, sitting at desks. And those who were standing had twice the rate of heart attacks. Hmm. This was completely unexpected. You know, we, we thought standing would be better for people, but not only does it not really help back pain or posture, it's actually worse in terms of heart disease. Um, so, you know, the, the, hope, it, the hope that so, something as simple as a standing desk would solve the problem turns out not just to be wrong, but catastrophically wrong. It's actually worse for people than sitting. Wow. That, thank you for shedding that light. <laughs> was not aware of the, um, the studies um, done behind it. So no, and it's, and it's fascinating to read the study because the people who did the study did not expect this to happen. You know, and when you read the discussion section of their paper, they're, they're, they're really struggling to say, how could this be? Mm -hmm. And their best guess is that if you're standing still, the, the blood pools in your legs because you're not walking and you don't have muscular contraction in your calves to help return the blood to the heart. And when blood sits around, blood isn't, an, blood isn't a fluid, it's an organ. And when it sits around in your legs because you're not actually walking, um, it becomes subclinically hypercoagulable. And if you have any rough spots in your coronary arteries, you can wind up with a MI, a heart attack. And that, that will ruin your whole day and maybe the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, it will ruin somebody's day for sure. So let's talk about um, so the need to walk, right? Walking seems like it's an uncomplicated activity. But we know with chronic back pain, that's the first thing to go. You start hunching back, you start holding your lower back, you start, um, you're unable to move and walk properly. So we know that there's, it's, a whole, it's, a, it's a whole system, 
right? There's strength, there's coordination, there's sensation that allows a person to walk effectively. So when one of these um, systems or interaction doesn't work properly, it really can mess you up. So go ahead and tell us some of the um, problems or issues that can arise simply, um, well, from, from, well, from sitting, and anyway, right, from um, being immobile. Well, when people sit for long periods of time, um, their muscles in their core go electrochemically dark. They just stop doing anything. And it turns out your muscles aren't just motor units that move your bones. They're immensely complicated biochemical factories that are spinning off you know, uh, lots of molecules that help regulate your internal system. So when people sit just slumped all day long, their bad cholesterol goes up, their good cholesterol goes down, their insulin goes, their insulin levels go up, their all-cause mortality goes up, and their muscles atrophy. Um, so we find that you know people who've been sitting slumped in front of a computer in some cases for decades, you know, have very very thin weak core muscles, and it can take quite a while, weeks, to, for their core strength to come back so that they can actually sit up all day long. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that um, really everybody can get back to having a core that's strong enough to support them because you know we. We, we still have the DNA of hunter-gatherers who are up and around all day long, and we can get it all back if we just, you know, allow people to uh, gradually um, reaccommodate to uh, sitting, supporting themselves. The idea of an office chair that imposes posture from outside and supports people from outside encourages their natural muscles just to waste away. Our idea of sitting is that you make uh, a chair that allows people to sit with a balanced posture. And so they're subtly using their big muscles all day long to balance their posture. This strengthens their muscles, but also uses their muscles all day long, which improves their internal biochemistry and protects them from sitting disease, you know, the constellation of, of uh, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and increased mortality. So just by uh, allowing people to move constantly while they sit, everything gets better. Yeah, so the, the strong muscles are the abdominal area and the glutes? Well, um, really the, 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 the muscles that produce posture are the internal and external oblique and the transversalis and the multifetus. They're, you know, these are they're big sheets of muscle that wrap around the, the torso and kind of organize everything. There are also an immense number of smaller muscles that go between the, uh, the vertebrae and help organize the spine. All of these various muscles are used in concert to produce posture. Actually figuring out how to do that would be immensely complicated. But fortunately, as, as children are learning to walk, they're programming their nervous system to be able to respond effectively to gravity. So your, your nervous system already has the reflexes to stand up straight and comfortable in gravity. You just have to allow that system that you painstakingly programmed as a child as you were going from crawling to toddling to walking to running. You, you have all those reflexes. If you just let them come back online, you know, people very quickly adopt um, a, a posture that's basically perfect merely by setting their hips free to move while they're sitting. And that's the red rocker, right? That's an active that, chair. Right. And, you know, there, there are other active chairs on the market. I don't mean to say that we're the only or even the first active chair on the market. But what our red rocker did was it allowed us to make a chair that was way less expensive than anyone else's. So that, you know, because as an epidemiologist, it's not enough to produce a solution. You have to produce a solution that people can afford. And while there were very cool active chairs out there, they were typically, you know, a thousand bucks or in that range. Our goal was to make a, a active chair that would be so uh, efficiently manufactured and so elegant in design that everybody could afford one. And it, it took some head scratching and um, the, the, the red rocker, the shape that we came to that allows our chair to move gracefully in all directions is um, it's a brand new geometric solid and it turns out um, you can patent such things. So we actually own this new geometric shape, which we call an eccentric bicylinder. It's the, it's the volume of intersection of two cylinders, and it, it allows um, rocking in all directions just because of the shape. I see. So um, tell us uh, how can, 
how can um, you sit and actively uh, be moving? Well, that's the cool thing about our chair is that you have to be active because, um, you know, no one has ever fallen asleep on our chair because you will slide right off. You have to <laughs> constantly be using your core to stay balanced on our chair. It's not, but your, your, your core musculature is having a silent conversation with gravity. You know, your reflexes are just automatically responding. So you can be like typing email or looking at a spreadsheet, but your core muscles are constantly rebalancing your spine over your, your ischial tuberosities, your sitting bones. And the work of doing that does two things. It adjusts your posture moment to moment so your posture is perfect, but it also is using these big muscles so you're burning glucose. Your, your, your basal metabolic rate goes up by 20% just by being balanced on our chair. You don't notice this, but we've had people say, that they've lost 20 and 30 pounds just by sitting on our chair because suddenly they're way more active than they were when they were just slumped on a chair. As a researcher, when somebody says something like that, I immediately disbelieve them, right? Because, you know, that, it's just that, you know. Uh, and, and, and also, I'd like to believe it, which makes it doubly dangerous for me. Um, but as a researcher, researchers, you know, when we're, like, out drinking beer together, we say things like, you know, if you throw a brick out the window and it falls up, that's very interesting, even if it only happens once. You know, you want to understand why that happened. And so, um, you know, when people tell us stuff like, you know, my back pain immediately stopped. Well, you know, I'm not sure. I, well, we've been told that dozens of times. So you almost have to start to believe it. And this guy's, you know, claiming that he lost all this weight. You know, he, it might be true. You know, I, I might just have. So it was interesting. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I know this guy. And so I would go by and drop in on him every month or two. And um, my son, who's very attuned to body image and stuff, you know, the first time we went by to see him, we said, you know, I, I think, I, I think he's lost weight. And I said, nah. And the next time, even I could see this guy was losing weight. And finally, I said, you know, are you losing weight? And he said, yeah, no, it's just like, it's just like disappearing. I said, do you have any pain or any, you know, blood coming out? Or, you know, I'm, I'm immediate, I'm a surgeon, right? I'm thinking he's got like some malignancy that's like making him lose weight. He says, no. I said, well, did you change anything? You change what you eat? Did you? No, I'm just losing weight. I think it's your chair. Mm. And I said, and so anyway, um, at the end of the day, I sort of have to believe this guy. Yeah, because he's engaging all the core muscles, all the muscles that you just mentioned. And so right. the metabolic and, rate is going up. And because he really had no other form of physical activity, just swapping out his, his like slumping all day chair for a chair that kept him moving all day made an immense difference in his overall caloric balance. Yeah. Can so, I see um, that again? Can I see the... So um, it's, um, you know, if you put this thing on a surface, it rocks. And if you put another surface on top of it, it rocks. And because they're 90 degrees opposed, it allows rocking in every direction. We, we have these things injection molded um, uh, in Milton, Vermont, about five miles from where I'm sitting by um, Dennis and Marie, who have a injection molding, they have half a dozen injection molding machines. These things are made out of polycarbonate, the same stuff that my eyeglasses are made out of. It'll be around long after I'm gone. Mm -hmm. You know, they're immensely strong and immensely simple. So there's nothing to break or wear out or adjust. It just it just makes the chair unstable just by sliding this under the seat of a chair. Just under the cushion. So you're not even looking at the the back of the chair. Yeah, please. So, so this is you know so this is how it is. You know, there's that that little red uh, lenticular lens shaped thing that's that's under the under the seat of the chair that just lets it move in every direction. We've got some video up on our website that like shows how this stuff works, but really it's, it's, um, it's a drop dead simple. Um, and you know, when I hit on this shape, I thought, oh boy, that's it. You know, any mathematician will tell you that if a solution looks beautiful, then you can start to believe it. Right, because and this, I mean, it's just a beautiful shape, right? Yeah, so I imagine you're not sitting directly on it, right? Because it's between the cushions, so you're not it, impacting the spine. You're right. not, yeah. 
Yeah, so so it sits right under the seat pan of the chair. So the you know the whole chair surface moves on top of this gizmo, and and then this gizmo sits on top of a standard office chair setup with a star base and a gas cylinder that lets you adjust the height. And and this is because um, they the solution would be a medicine ball, and you've seen that in offices. Right. No. So I I sat on a I sat on one of those. Uh, uh, yoga balls for seven years and what you see when people sit on yoga balls is several problems one is you can't adjust the height um, because uh, it's not adjustable mm -hmm. and not only that nobody even knows what the height of a yoga ball is because how tall it is depends on uh, how much air pressure is inside it how much you weigh what the barometric pressure is what the temperature is so all that stuff is is a problem so you can't fix the height of a yoga ball and mostly they're too too low for people to sit on because you want to sit with your knees lower than your hips. Additionally, in order to really sit well, you have to be able to feel your ischial tuberosities. Um, now this, this is a human pelvis. Um, well, it's a model of a human pelvis. Um, and when you, when you, you have, the, and this is like where the babies come out, yeah. Uh, and so you've got these two bony prominences underneath the, the pelvis. And this is the kickstand for the human body. This is what people sit on. And in order to sit and balance your spine, you have to be able to feel where your sits bones are, where your ischial tuberosities are. And in yoga ball, it's just a cloud. So people can't get organized and they can't really adjust their posture. And so they just slump. Our chair lets people feel their ischial tuberosity so they can adjust their posture and use the reflexes that they've developed for walking while they're sitting to organize their posture and you know their, their spine and also be using the muscles that are there for walking constantly while they're sitting. Yeah, and it's a subtle movement, right? Because you're currently sitting on it. You're not rocking. It's not right. dramatic. It's but, but, you know, when you get bored, you can, like, you know, play games, you know. <laughs> but but you have to be constantly using your muscles to stay balanced because, as I say, no one has ever fallen asleep on one of our chairs. And people say, you know, I used to need an espresso at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, but sitting on your chairs, you know, I'm just, I, I don't. I'm just constantly energized because I'm constantly in motion. Very nice. And can this be installed? In a home. So uh, we we tried for a while to you know ship people you know pieces of our chair so they could kind of MacGyver it, but that just turned out to be a, a lot of darn trouble. So now we just put everything in a box. So the box comes, you you put the star base on the ground, you put the gas cylinder in it, you put the seat on top of it, and you know it it, it takes about a minute to put it together. Um, so um, it, we we just found that it's way simpler for people and way more reliable. We know exactly what people are going to wind up with. Because in the when we were first starting out, we would send people pieces, and they they put it on a piano bench, or they put it on a coffee table, or they put it on I don't know what at, at all these weird heights, and it was just too much trouble to try and get it all working for them individually, email by email. Yeah. So we thought, okay, we'll just put it in a box, and what they get will work. Huh. Very interesting. And how are kids involved in this? Right. So um, you know if. If you know, kids are now turning up at, in chiropractors' offices with back pain, which you know just cuts you to the quick because kids should not be having back pain. You know, it's what we're doing to them. We're making them sit. We're making them sit all day in school. We're making them sit on crappy school chairs because nobody is. I mean, schools can't afford glitter for preschoolers' art projects for crying out loud. So they sure aren't. You know, spending much time trying to design better furniture for kids. And if you look at school furniture, it's mostly designed to be stackable. So a custodian can stack it and mop the floor easily. It's nothing about sitting well or sitting with good posture. So we thought, you know, kids, you know, that, that's a group that, you know, really will need some help. But there's no one advocating for them and there's no money. So how do you, how do, you do that? So we had the idea that we would make chairs for kids that would be free. So how do you do that? Well, um, we cooked up a design that's just made out of plywood. I did a TED talk on it. Um, you, you, you just take a sheet of plywood, put it on a CNC router, a thing that cuts plywood like a cookie cutter yeah. cuts cookie dough. This cuts plywood. And then you download a file that we have up on the website, and, and it'll make your CNC router cut out the pieces for what we call a button chair. 
And these pieces fit together with a special joint we dissolve, that we design that doesn't need screws or glues or anything. You just tap it with a mallet and it all locks together. And for a rocking mechanism, um, we started out using a tennis ball, which you know provides pretty good rocking. But um, we found when we started uh, passing these things out in schools here in Burlington, the kids were just wearing out the tennis balls. So we had to, because they rock a lot, yeah. you know? And so we had to- wear and tear too. It's not that material that you have that will last well, forever. The plywood is plenty tough, but the, they were wearing out the tennis balls. So we had to switch to lacrosse balls and they hadn't been able to wear those out. Can I show you here? <laughs> or, or um, what do you call it? Lacrosse and, um, they elude me right now. So this is, uh, so this is what we call a button chair because uh, the top of it kind of looks like a button. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, it's made out of uh, two pieces of plywood that make four legs and then uh, a piece of plywood that locks it together and a piece of plywood that's the seat. And then there's a lacrosse ball that sits in there and lets the seat top move. Yeah. So anyway, we have a we have a website where we you know kind of provide people with the directions to make these things with a CNC router, and we have another set of directions if you just have hand tools in a basement shop, so you can make them one at a time. And we also you know for people who live in an apartment don't have any tools, you know we we can we have a we have a company in northeastern Vermont, Newport Furniture, that makes these things. So that we definitely make it accessible. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> well, you know, our, our idea was that, uh, you know, that's what design is about. It's about solving a problem in a way that, you know, is elegant, solves the problem, and does it at a price point that, you know, is achievable. And we thought free would be a good one. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's not exact. I mean, you have to buy the plywood and this and that and the other thing. But our idea is that schools can make as many of these chairs as they want. And really what we want is we want high schoolers to be making these things and then, you know, then they can hand them off to kids in preschool or first grade or second grade and schools can become sort of self-supporting self, uh, self in their furniture rather than having to, you know, be parasitized by the chair industry. You, it's home ec, home ec, right? You'd be learning, you'd be um, designing and geometry is all part of it. Oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a whole, it's like a whole curriculum, you know, but design and and uh, making and so on and and um when we dropped them off at a school here in burlington the kids painted each kid painted his own chair it was it was it's fun and, you know, it's it's uh, they, they had a good time and and, and i learned a lot yeah. um, cncs are not cheap though those those machines are not cheap so you'd have to have a shop to go to take them to a local shop with a cnc machine to actually right, do the cut right right but uh, but many maker spaces have a cnc router and many high schools these days turn out to have a CNC router because part of just woodworking, right? I mean, it's it's sort of advanced woodworking, but it's the kind of thing that you know kids, if you know, if kids can can create their own video games, they can program a CNC router. Um, and and uh, a CNC router, you know, you can buy a desktop CNC router um, for two or three thousand dollars, and you can buy a CNC router that's industrial grade for ten or twelve thousand dollars. So it's not crazy to expect the high school would have one. Many maker spaces have one, and um, I, you know, there there are like half a dozen here in Burlington, Vermont, and and everybody seems to be willing to donate time to a good cause like chairs for kids. Right, right. No, because it's it's a whole movement. What you're doing is. It's unique, it's innovative, and it's changing the chair, you know? Right. Why didn't nobody yeah. think of this before? <laughs> no, and that's, and that's why, um, that's why we, we, I got this idea of kids, because I went to an ergonomic conference in, uh, you know, an academic ergonomic conference with a bunch of, you know, people who study this kind of stuff for their whole lives and have PhDs in it, and I brought along some of our chairs, and um I met a guy there who's, you know, very famous in the world of chair design. He was part of the Herman Miller Aeron chair design team in 1994. They've sold 8 million of these office chairs. You know, he's a big deal. I mean, he's got, you know, stubble and a scarf and groupies. I mean, he's he's a big deal in the world of chair design. So I was just like talking to him and, you know, we had a robust conversation and um, and we swapped email addresses. And when I get back to Burlington, I found an email from this guy and he says, you know, I feel terrible. I spent my whole life trying to make chairs so comfortable, no one would want to get up. 
And now you tell me that sitting slumped all day is terrible for people. But what do you want me to do? You know, we've convinced people that they can't sit without a backrest and lumbar support and a headrest. And now I can't sell a chair unless it has all that stuff. And you're telling me that stuff is exactly the problem. You know, and, and these guys have this legacy that they've created. People expect uh, all this support from their chair, which is really the problem. And so we're not trying to make a better chair. We're trying to upend the idea of what a, a chair is. And that's not an easy thing to do because everybody thinks they know what a chair is. They're wrong, but you know, it's going to be very hard to convince them. But kids, kids are open to new ideas. Oh, yeah, and so you yeah. start that generation off, it's going to change. It's going to trickle out, so you, they'll do the work <laughs> themselves. It's, it's phenomenal. Exactly. It's phenomenal. Exactly. Um, Dr. Turner, tell us, how do you get up, dress up, and show up? What's your morning routine like? So um, one thing I do is um, I, I get up early because I was a surgeon for many, many years, and so I get up at 5 just automatically. So automatically I, I have sort of a jump on the day. But I, I use that time very, very carefully. You know, I, 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 uh, I drink some rosehip tea, and I just sit there and think for a while. And then I go for a walk, you know, through an orchard that's nearby, and think about stuff. Yeah. And exactly what I think about, I don't plan. And then I come back and I sit down and I make some espresso and then I make a list of what I need to do today. And simply by you know letting my brain kind of think about what needs to be done and then supercharge it with a little caffeine <laughs> and then make a list, uh, pretty much uh, that, that makes the day extremely efficient. And what's on the list, you know, varies, you know, sometimes it's to remind me to, you know, get the taxes done, but often it's, you know, some, some design thing we're working on to Im improve some model of our chair or, um, you know, some, well, you know, what you might say to a podcaster who wants to talk about chairs. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. But I think what, what stands out to me so much is the fact that you are very intentional about what you do in that first hour of the mm -hmm. day. That's what sets you apart. That's what sets successful individuals apart from everyone else is we got to know how we spend the first um, 10 to 20 minutes of our day because that really sets the tone for the rest of it. Well, it sets the tone for the rest of the day. And by making a list, it really lays out the rest of the day. Yeah, it's, it's like a, a, a brain dump where you don't have to think about it throughout the day. You have a list, you go into it and check it off because the brain, again, is designed to solve your problems. So it wants to automate everything. Right. And when you wake up in the morning, you know, the brain's kind of been working on problems all, not, all right. night. I want to give it the opportunity to kind of dump what it's come up with for you. Yeah. I mean, your brain wants to help you. It does. You just have to give it a chance. Mm -hmm. And be intentional about it. That's mm -hmm. when the, the setting up the good habits are essential. You got to really know how the brain is designed because habits are formed to solve our problems. The brain right. wants to automate everything that we do, like learning how to drive. Remember that, how attentive we were, we were with hands on the wheel and making sure we have our blinkers. And then three yeah. months after getting our license, it's a one hand. We are so relaxed. We're so relaxed or, at that point. Or, or even more, you know, a few years after that, you walk out of the house and get in the car and then suddenly you're right. three miles away and you have no idea what you did in between. You know, yeah. it's because utterly automatic and you just hope that the guy who's driving the car when i'm not is like careful <laughs> it's fantastic the way the brain works and if we understand that then we know how to hack it then we know right. how to direct oh, it yeah no it's 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 uh you know the brain has these efficiencies built in you know so that you don't have to think about every single thing that you do every time and just so with sitting, you know, how you sit in a chair, you know, you develop a habit. And if it's a bad habit, it's catastrophic. But if you sit on a chair that, you know, keeps you, um, keeps your spinal reflexes alert and learning and improving, then your sitting just gets better and better. Um, so merely by making the single swap of, you know, getting rid of your crummy office chair and replacing it with an active chair, every minute that you spend sitting is improved. It truly is forming new habits. I agree. And, 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 and typically, you know, you, you know, if you want to, oh, I want to jog. Okay, fine. You have to make the decision to jog every morning. It's snowing. It's raining. It's hard. 
But it, but you only have to make the decision to switch your chair once, mm -hmm. and then you benefit forever. And it will become automatic. Like you won't even think about it. The movement you're trying to balance it out. The body's gonna. It's like muscle know memory, body knowing. Muscles gonna right. know. Body, that's kind of, kind of like riding a bicycle. Your body knows. And 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 actually, you get to the point where if you sit on a normal chair because you went to a coffee shop back in the days when we went to coffee shops, it feels weird. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't move. <laughs> I can talk to you all day about this, Dr. Turner, but before, let's talk about how people can connect with you. Oh, okay. So um, I, uh, I gave a TED Talk. So if you just Google TEDx Osler, you'll find my TED Talk talking about many of these things. And we also have a website, uh, QOR360.com. That you know, it, I mean, I write a blog and there are videos and there's all kinds of stuff. It just goes on and on forever. Um, I, I, I hasten to say it's it's younger people on my team who do search engine optimization and web design and all that stuff. I just I just write the blog and they like humor me by putting it up on the on the website. So those, and, and we also have a website for our free button chairs for kids, which is button chairs b u t t o n c h a i r r s dot com. Sorry, but dot, dot org because it's it's like a it's a uh, uh, I don't know it's a social project. It's not a company. Um, so if you go to buttonchairs.org, there's a website there that lets you download the plans for our free plywood chairs for kids. And again, thank you so much for providing that and making it so accessible to our to our students, our well, kids. It's really um, really a generational shift is about to take place because of this. That's the plan. Yeah. Now kids can learn. Yeah. Grown ups have more. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been a pleasure oh. having you having you on. Thanks so much, Lenny. Yeah, it's been a delight. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please comment and tell us what was your favorite part, your favorite habit that you are going to try out for yourself today. Comment below. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. Until next time, I will see you at the top of your best morning routine ever. Stay blessed.